finish the letter now. Paul has attacked the false teachers. He's given some practical application for life, and he's, he's gearing down now to close, say some personal greetings to some people that he knew that were still active in the ministry in the area. Uh, he's going to close the book on the note of prayer. Boy, I think if one thing is true of the modern church is we have not because we ask not. The life of Jesus Christ in getting up early in the morning, going out by himself to pray, condemns us for our prayerlessness in our own day. Paul closes this epistle by, by admonishing them and calling them, pleading with them for a meaningful, consistent, intercessory prayer life. Listen to what he says. Verse 2. You must preserve in prayer. That is a present imperative from the root to be strong. This is very similar to the ending in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. When all is said about the spiritual warfare, Paul comes back to prayer as one of the main ingredients of the Christian soldier. And here he comes back to conclude this epistle by saying, pray, be strong, persevere, present imperative in prayer. And by this means stay wide awake. Now, this seems to be three aspects of prayer. One is perseverance. Another is staying wide awake. Kind of reminds me of Mark uh, 14, 38, when Jesus asked the disciples to stay and keep watch and pray, and they couldn't do it. This is also a present participle. When it says stay awake, do you know the word Greek word for awake, staying awake, is the, word, is the uh, name Gregory? Many children are named after that. Gregory, English Gregory. And you give thanks. Boy, this was a man in prison imploring the people who were loose to give thanks to God. This, this whole epistle can almost be called an epistle of thanksgiving. Listen to the number of times he mentions thanksgiving in this book. Chapter 1, verse 3, verse 12. Chapter 2, verse 7. Chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. Chapter 4, verse 2, with thanksgiving. Our lives ought to be bathed in a prayer of thanksgiving to God for what we are and who we have. It shows our spiritual contentness with thanksgiving. At the same time, keep on praying for me. Paul knows the power of prayer. And he doesn't stop saying, please pray for me. But it's amazing what Paul asked for him. He doesn't ask for anything personal. But he asked for some things about the ministry. This is what he says. Number one that God may open the door of opportunity for the message. Now, maybe he means that he will get his ultimate freedom out of prison, or maybe it means that he'll have more opportunity in prison in Rome to share the gospel. I'm not sure what it means. Number two, that I may tell the open secret about Christ for the sake of which I am held a prisoner. That's perfect passive. This open secret, the word mystery, is beautifully defined in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 9. It's been hidden from the ages. It was hidden from the, the world, from the Gentiles. It was even hidden from the Jews. And it was hidden from the angels. What is this open secret, this mystery that's now clearly revealed? It's that Christ is the beginning of a brand new race of people. There's no more Jew. There's no more Greek. There's no more male. There's no more female. There's no more slave. There's no more free. There's no more black or white. There's no more rich or poor. There's no more intelligent. There's no more uh, uninformed. Uh, There's just those in Christ. That's the secret. One new humanity in Christ, the church. Um, and then number three, in order that to make it evident why I have to tell it, Here's the idea of clearly revealing the gospel. Notice the word have is the word dia, moral necessity. Paul had to share, and he prayed it'd be clearly evident what he had to tell. Now in verse 5, we talk about what prayer will do for the Christian life. Uh, practice living prudently, and literally it means in wisdom walk. Be, be smart about how you live. Live prudently in your relations with outsiders. It's very important how we live among the world. We're trying to bring them to Jesus Christ. The purpose of our life is to glorify God and bring us to Jesus Christ. Be careful how you live among outsiders. Making the most of your opportunities. Redeeming the time is literally. That's the idea that our lives need to be soul winning oriented. Making the most of the opportunities. And finally, always let your conversation, lifestyle, be salted with salt, seasoned with salt. 
It's the idea that salt preserves, gives flavor to. That we are the salt of the earth in the Sermon on the Mount. And so here's the idea with the, all of our talk needs to be for the purpose of redeeming the time in relation to outsiders. We need to talk in such a way that we'll draw people to Christ. They'll see a uniqueness and difference. With winsomeness, y'all see Ephesians 4, 29. So that you uh, may know how to make a fitting answer to everyone. Y'all see 1 Peter 3, 15. Give an answer to anyone who asks for the hope that's in you. Friends, I believe there is a spiritual gift of evangelism that is very fruitful. But I also believe it is responsibility of every Christian to share what God through Christ has done in their life. I think there's a spiritual gift of, of giving, but that didn't relieve me from giving because it's a spiritual gift of giving. And some can give so freely and wonderfully and openly. I still, every individual Christian ought to give. Every individual Christian ought to witness. And I just want to tell you very boldly, if you haven't come to the place in your life where you're willing to let God's good news flow through you, you're never going to be the mature Christian God wants you to be. Now, you may not be as fruitful as others, but you've got to be willing to share when the opportunity opens itself. I think that's really important. How to make a fitting answer to everyone. And here the context is talking about outsiders, unbelievers. It's not sharing your testimony of Christian worship service we're talking about. This is to outsiders that you have prepared to listen by the way that you've lived in front of them. Now, in verse 7, it says, My dearly loved Tychicus. Now, Tychicus is the bearer of the letter from Paul in prison. There are several men we're going to get into. Uh, I've kind of put them on a graphic. I'd like to show that graphic to you at this time. Uh, we'll go to a full page in just a moment. Uh, those are all in your Bible there, and I've listed some of the places where they're mentioned. Now, you ought to have a reference Bible, and you need to look up in your reference Bible where these men are mentioned. I want to talk about some of them as we go through here, but the best thing to do is look them up in a Bible dictionary or just look in your reference Bible, and you can see every one of them. The first one is Tychicus. Now, Epaphras is the one who started the church. He's also mentioned in there. You see that in Colossians 1.7. Epaphras came and told Paul the problems in prison. Paul wrote a letter, and he sent the letter of Colossians, the letter of Ephesians, and the letter of Philemon back to Asia Minor with the slave Onesimus, who's also mentioned in here. And so Tychicus is the bearer of the letters and also the companion of Onesimus. Boy, he was a, a great fellow. You see Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21-22. Uh, it calls him, My dearly loved Tychicus, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord's work, uh, will tell you all about me. He came verbally and writtenly to talk to him. I am sending him to you for the express purpose of letting you know my circumstances and of cheering your heart. Isn't that just like Paul? There's Paul sitting in a stinking prison, and he sends a messenger to encourage their hearts. <laughs> um, he is accompanied by Onesimus, a faithful and dearly loved brother, who is one of your own number. Now, apparently Paul met this runaway slave who somehow got thrown in jail at Rome. Now, his master's name is Philemon. There's a little bitty book in the Bible named Philemon, one chapter. And Paul is sending him back to this slave owner who he also knew as a dearly beloved Christian brother now, not just a slave, but he sent him back. Uh, a faithful and dearly loved brother who is one of your own number, and they will tell you everything that is going on here. And now Paul goes to another, uh, that's this series of, of friends. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner. Now, we don't know if this is a metaphor of Christian service or if Aristarchus was actually in prison too. Now, some of these men we have listed in several places. We're not 100% sure it's always the same man. It's kind of like calling someone Bob or John. You never know if you know about the right Bob or the right John. Uh, this Aristarchus is Acts 19, 29, Acts 20, verse 4, and Acts 27, verse 2. Okay, uh, which is to be remembered to you, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Now, Barnabas, as you know, was the uh, original, um, what should I say, 
Barnabas is such a wonderful guy. He's the guy that went and got Paul. He's the guy that had trust in Paul. He's the guy that started the first missionary journey, took Paul with him. But they had a terrible hair pull over John Mark, and that's the guy named Mark here. They were just furious, uh, had a terrible fight over that. Paul wouldn't take him the second time Barnabas wanted to. They split the mission team over this. Uh, John Mark later on, uh, I think it's 1 Timothy 4, uh, 2 Timothy 4 says, bring John Mark, uh, for he's helpful to me in the ministry. Paul got over it, but he did. There was a lot of problems over this. Um, now, these three people, uh, Aristarchus and Mark through here, uh, these seem to be three Jewish Christians, okay? Uh, because it mentions that in verse 11. So, does Jesus, who is called Justice, now we don't know who he is anywhere else, not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. But then it says, are these the only converts from Judaism? So these are men of the circumcision, if you please, uh, that are fellow workers with me here in the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is Jesus' major topic in the Gospels. It's the su subject of his first sermon, his last sermon. It's the subject of every parable the kingdom of God is likened to. It is basically the reign of God in men's hearts now that will one day be consummated over God's reign over all the earth. When Jesus says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, he's praying for the kingdom of God to come. It's a present reality with a future consummation, uh, who has proved a real comfort to me. Um, we get the word comfort here. We get the English paragarch from right here. Uh, verse 12, Epaphras. Now, he's the one that founded the church in the, La in the Lycus River Valley. Probably Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. You see that in Colossians 1, 7. He's the one that brought the word. One of your own number, a slave of Jesus Christ, which should be remembered to you, he is always earnestly pleading for you in his prayers that you may stand fast as mature men of firm convictions in everything required by the will of God. Now, the word earnestly pleading, it, we get the English word agony from this. It's a very strong athletic term. So he was really a prayer warrior that prayed for these people who he was able to start a church there. Now, Notice where it says that you may stand fast as mature men. That's the word perfect in King James. It means fully equipped, ripe, come of age, complete. Of firm convictions. This is the word fully assured. You ought to see Romans 2.21 uh, or another place where it's used is to fulfill in 2 Timothy 4, 5, and 17. And it's perfect passive, by the way. Uh, then verse 13, For I can testify how great is his toiling, that's a spiritual struggle, for you, for you is, and for the brothers in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Now these were two little towns in the same Lycus River Valley. Uh, verse 14, Our dearly loved Luke, the physician. Now Luke is apparently a Gentile because he's mentioned the circumcision. Luke is the author of the Gospel of Luke and Acts. Luke was C Paul's constant companion sometime on the second missionary journey. How Luke got on the boat that Paul was being taken to Rome, we don't know. I think Paul personally had oriental ophthalma or an eye disease. And apparently Luke was with him and ministered to him and helped him physically as well as spiritually. Boy, what a great man Luke is. Uh, then with Demas. Now, Demas we find again in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, where Paul says, Demas has forsaken me, loving this present world. Now, we don't know what happened to Demas. Uh, I preached a sermon on 1 Timothy 4 where I call the, the dropouts, the once-outs, and the never-outs. <laughs> it's talking about Luke, Demas, and John Mark. And all of them are mentioned here, too. John Mark fell out, but he came back. Luke stayed the whole time, and Demas was faithful and then dropped. I don't know if Demas was looking for a bigger church or looking for a better place of service or what happened, but Paul says he's deserted me, loving the present world. Boy, how many, how many times that happens to ministers? How many times it happens to laymen? Now, then it says, I wish to be remembered to you. Remember me to the brothers in Laodicea and to Nympha. Now, this can either be masculine or feminine. We don't know if it's a woman or a man uh, because of uh, the ambiguity of the ending. And to the church that meets in his or her house. You see, the early churches were not buildings but groups of people. And it's unfortunate today that many people think of the church as a building. The church is the people of God congregating in a local area to do ministry. Okay, meet in her house. Verse 16, when this letter has been read to you, read it to the church at Laodicea too. Now what they did with Paul's letters, they read them out loud in the churches. They usually made a copy and kept it in the church archives and passed the letter on to other churches. Now, 
This is what it says. And see to it that you read the one that is coming to you from Laodicea. Now, I, I'm not sure what my really position is on this. I used to think the letter to, from the Laodiceans was the letter of Ephesians, for the book of Ephesians is a circular letter, and in Ephesus is blank in the best manuscripts. But it doesn't seem to be enough time here. If uh, Tychicus brought both the letters with him, it doesn't seem to be enough time for that letter to circulate, so maybe we do have a lost letter of Paul here. I just really don't know. Um, but notice that the church has passed letters around, and all of them read. And tell Archippus, see to it that you continue until you fulfill your full ministry. Present, active, subjunctive. We don't know what his ministry was. We don't know what he was doing. Uh, but uh, God knows, and many of these men are just mentioned once and never again, uh, which you received in the Lord's work. Verse 18, this farewell greeting in my own hand. I think Paul used a secretary. But I don't think he could write well. But there begin to be some some suspicion of false letters by Paul. You might look at 2 Thessalonians 3.17. So Paul would take the pen in his own hand and he would write. And since he was, I think he was blind, he wrote with large letters. One time he said, see with what large letters I'm writing you. Uh, and so he would sign the last few sentences himself. And this is what I think verse 18 is. In my own hand from Paul, remember that I am still a prisoner. He's asking for prayer in a subtle way. Spiritual blessings be with you. Grace be with you. And he closed it out that way. Now the book of Ephesians is, is a parallel to Colossians. As Colossians is fast and terse and hard hitting and there's many broken sentences and Paul you can just see him walking back and forth spitting this letter out. Ephesians is deep and strong and long sentences and thought through uh, logical sequences. Uh, Colossians says hello to many people. Ephesians says hello to nobody. It's for, it's for a larger area. Uh, to fully get the impact of Colossians, you ought to read Ephesians and Colossians together. They almost go point for point. I wanted to add a point to that that I think is so important. I've just recently gone back through Ephesians again, and it amazes me how significant this parallel nature of these two books is on very significant doctrines. You know, there's a lot of controversy in the church right now about what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And, of course, the command for that is in Ephesians 5, 18. And, you know, it's really important that we see that the parallel in Colossians answers the question what being filled with the Spirit is. Now, in Ephesians, I think the context of the examples from the home and spiritual warfare show us the context of the daily Christ-likeness that's involved in being filled with the Spirit. But what really nails that interpretation down is when you know that Colossians 3.16 is the parallel to Ephesians 5.18. And so in Colossians 3.16 it says, Let the mind of Christ d richly dwell in you. Well, that is the parallel for what being filled with the Spirit is. We have a unique opportunity in these two books and probably nowhere else that I know of in the Scriptures to see the mind of a, of, a, of a biblical writer like Paul as he writes that sh very fast, sharp, terse letter to the heretics in the Lycus River Valley, then on the same outline writes a deep, involved, uh, thought-through treatise that's a circular letter to all the churches and, of course, finally uh, wound up in Ephesus that finally filled the blank in with its name, and that's where we get uh, the book of Ephesians from. And, and that's so helpful. I, I tell you, I have really enjoyed the book of Colossians and Ephesians. I never knew what tremendous, tremendous theological pillars they are. And I, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope I have uh, encouraged you by some of my uh, exegesis and interpretation to begin to study uh, particularly Colossians and Ephesians uh, on your own. As you know, evangelical Protestantism is basically Pauline. And therefore, it's real important that we understand the positions of Paul as they're represented in, in the New Testament and not just what we think they are. So I want to take these last few minutes to go over some resource books with you that I think will really help you in your study of Paul. The first uh, set of books that I want to talk about are some books that deal primarily with the man Paul. Now, here's a good one by A.T. Robertson that I really trust. This is called Epics in the Life of Paul, and this deals with the man himself. And a book like this is really going to give you some insight into the person of Paul. Another older book that I think is excellent is, uh, is on the life of Paul, The Origins of Paul's Religion by Macon, who is a very conservative scholar at the old Princeton School. 
And uh, this is put out by Erdman's. I think you'll really like this one. Another man that I personally love very much is A Man in Christ by James Stewart. Uh, this book, in my opinion, has one of the best dealings with some of Paul's theology as relates to who he is as a person. And boy, I hope you'll get this. He has some other ones called The Teachings of Christ that are just excellent. A Man in Christ by James Stewart. Uh, also, there's a book by William Barclay. Um, I have some problems with William Barclay's logical positivism, his uh, nervousness about miracles, but he's done a good job here on the life of Paul, and I think it'll help you very much. Uh, the Mind of St. Paul by William Barclay. And then finally, I guess my favorite author uh, that's alive today, who I think is the greatest conservative evangelical scholar available, is F.F. F. Bruce. And he's put one called The Apostle uh, of the uh, Paul, the Apostle of the Heart Set Free. And anything F.F. F. Bruce writes, I like. And this is going to be an excellent book to kind of get a background of who the apostle is. Now, when you come to a man like Paul, you're really looking to see how he relates to different books in the Bibles. And what we're talking about is, a, is systematic theologies. And this is one of the books that most modern Christians simply have uh, no familiarity with. But we're looking for a book that not only tell us the parallels between Colossians and Ephesians as far as uh, not only content and thought and words, but that will relate Paul's thought to other passages in Paul, particularly the, the doctrinal books of Romans and Galatians, but also his other writings, and then far beyond that to other New Testament writers, and even beyond that uh, to Old Testament background. Now, I have two uh, theology of the New Testament that I like very much. One of them is by Frank Stagg, New Testament Theology. I teaches at Southern Seminary. I think he's done an excellent job on relating Paul's theology in a concise, systematic way, and it is very helpful in its extensive index. And then I guess one of my favorite writers today is from Fuller Seminary, George Ladd. I really like his commentary on Revelation. I guess basically I'm a historical pre, and he has done one on New Testament theology that does the same thing that Frank Stagg books does, and that relates the concepts, the pillars of Paul's thoughts, and where you can find them in different books. Now, I guess the, <clears throat> pardon me, the capstone of all of these is a book that I recently found by Riddleboss. It's translated from German into English called Paul, an outline of his theology. If you're going to buy one book on Paul, this to me is the most significant book you can get. Now, I don't agree with anything he says. He comes from a different uh, tradition, a European tradition. But he has really challenged me on some general concepts, justification by faith, sanctification, Paul's use of metaphors, uh, how Paul relates different truths. And I want to tell you, this book will really help you understand the teachings of Paul, which is so central uh, to modern Protestantism. It's extensively indexed, and if I have told you all before, the way to do these things, if you buy them, is to make a certain colored mark on the book, like a red square, or a green triangle, or a purple circle. And then in your study Bible, turn to the back of these books, and each one of them is just extensively indexed. And by every passage listed back here, put that characteristic mark in your study Bible. And then when you're going through and reading a passage, you'll know what book that you have, that these, these are reference books now, that you can go and find that point. And I think it's really going to be helpful to you. Since I was on books, and it's one of my favorite things, uh, I wanted to show you the two volumes uh, that have been so stimulating to my thought. These are the most challenging books that I've read in the last, I bet, five years. And it has really caused me to rethink through some of the things that I've always heard but never could really pin down biblically. And that's so good for all of us. These are, this is volumes one and two. It's called Essentials of Evangelical Theology by Donald Bloch, put out by Harper and Rowe. These are indexed. They deal primarily with Paul's systematic theology, but they are so helpful. They will really challenge you to, to and what you believe and why. And the truth is, most of us believe because we've always been told this or we expect the Bible to say this. And it's so good to try to take those filters of denominational person experience and culture off and let a, let a fellow like this give you a systematic presentation of someone like Paul whose thought has just a, so molded the New Testament and our understanding of it. And these books will be a blessing to you. But now, don't buy them unless you're going to read them and index them, because that way they'll help you throughout your study of the New Testament, particularly Paul, but throughout the New Testament, and even give you some great cross-references to difficult passages in the Old Testament. 
I think Ephesians and Colossians can come alive to you. When these books, first of all, open the background, the purpose of the book, they describe the heresy to you. They talk about the problems faced by Paul in this area. It's really going to challenge it. you. You're going to love it. And uh, I think you'll hug my neck one day for getting you in touch with these books and showing you how to use them if you'll be faithful when you do this. And, and I think it'll bring great joy. There's nothing more exciting than finding truth from God's Word for yourself and not having to be spoon-fed, pre-digested food by a Sunday school teacher, a radio preacher, or even your favorite pastor because you need to know what you believe for yourself. And these books will challenge you to think through what you've done. Well, I hope you'll read back through Colossians and Ephesians, maybe outline them in your own words. It'll be a great blessing to you. And I hope you enjoy your pilgrimage to the Apostle Paul. What a great mind who brings the Jewish background into a Gentile setting and locks down for us the great truths that Jesus came to present to all men. Well, I've really enjoyed being with you, and I'll see you again, same time, same place, next week. God bless you.